Good evening. My name is Ashley Salazar. I'm the new Chief Advancement and External Relations Officer for the UNM School of Medicine. And uh, I get the pleasure of welcoming you all to our community lecture series tonight. And on behalf of the School of Medicine, thank you so much for being here. The community lecture series is just one of the many ways that the UNM School of Medicine carries out its mission of contributing to the health of New Mexicans. So we're very proud of the series. And tonight I want to thank Albuquerque Academy for graciously hosting the series, as well as the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences for their support and planning of tonight's lecture. And thank you to the staff, our staff at the Office of Alumni Relations and the UNM School of Medicine as a whole, as a whole for helping us in the planning. This evening's presentation is going to be taped by the city of Albuquerque and photographed by UNM School of Medicine. And I wanna thank the city for those videography efforts and for making the recording available within a month's time. We'll also have a question and answer session at the end of the lecture. However, the session is not going to be recorded so that you can feel safe and comfortable to submit your questions, which can be uh, submitted on the note cards that were provided at the beginning of the night. And now I'm honored to be able to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Avi Preichman is a board certified child psychiatrist and a graduate of the Ackerman Institute for the Family, one of the premier institutions for family therapy in the United States. He currently leads the Alliance Building for Suicide Prevention and Youth Resilience Grant in New Mexico. And for more than 40 years, Dr. Kreitschman has helped children, adolescents, and families in school, tribal, urban, and rural communities. He has extensive training and experience in strength-based psychotherapies and has helped leadership, held leadership roles in academic teaching hospitals and national health organizations. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Avi Kreitschman. Uh, thanks everyone for, for joining me today, this evening, to talk about how to keep youth safe. And really appreciate all of you coming here, especially in this inclement weather. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is how to identify youth at risk and more importantly what all of us can do not just therapists or teachers but all of us in the community can do to help young people stay safe um, and also i'm going to talk about if someone does commit suicide does die by suicide what happens to those who are left behind and that is not just family members that's teachers and classmates and friends and neighbors. So we're going to talk about surviving suicide as well. But before I start, I wanted to give a couple of thank yous. So one is I wanted to recognize Pari Naskin, um, who works in our department, who has been absolutely essential in getting this together. I wanted to thank Jit Wagner-Jones. Where is she? In the back. Um, who's also helped in forming all of this. I wanted to thank Richard Hogel, who I just met, who is helping my weak voice be transmitted through this sound system. I'm greatly appreciative of that. Um, and I wanted to thank um, two other folk um, from the Department of Psychiatry, my chair, Mauricio Toen, and Carly Bonham, who is the uh, director of the division of community behavioral health, and um, both of them have been essential in supporting community engagement and working at youth resiliency and safety. So thanks to all of you. Um, what I'd like to do today is um, review a lot of material, but I'm going to hit basically the highlights. Since this is being videotaped, um, I have a lot more information on the slide that I'm going to actually refer to, and that's so that people who see it can benefit by, by just pausing on the screen. All of you should have gotten some handouts that have a lot of additional information. So as we talked about, 
I'll probably talk for maybe 40, 45 minutes and leave a lot of time for the Q&A. The Q&A will not be recorded, so you don't have to be concerned about um, violating your privacy or confidentiality. Um, and it won't be transmitted to anyone except the people in the auditorium. At the end of the presentation, there's information about both the program that I lead with my colleagues, and I wanted to acknowledge another person who's here, David Lardier, who's a member of the Aspire team. Um, some of the other folks um, are now snowbound in Colorado um, and can't join us. Um, and also uh, the New Mexico Crisis Access Line. And there's a lot of material in the front um, that Pari wanted to urge me that all of you should access so she doesn't have to schlep it home. Um, so please um, avail yourself of that. I also have a slide with their contact information. So let's go over what we're going to review tonight. So basically, key thing that I want to leave you with is that suicides are preventable. They're difficult to assess. They're difficult to identify. And sometimes um, people kill themselves seemingly without warning. But there are some things that all of us can do to try to minimize the risk that if someone does attempt suicide, that their attempt is lethal. And we'll talk a lot about that. Then we're going to talk about New Mexico and the issues in our state. We're going to talk about myths about suicide. And the reason that that's important is a lot of these false beliefs that people have prevent people from getting help. So we want to demystify those issues so that people can get the kind of help that they need. Also, we're going to talk about warning signs and risk factors. Now, the key distinction here is that warning signs are not for all of us. These are the warning signs that tell that particular person, things are not going well for me. I might need to have some help. Okay? So what we're going to fold that into is reasons for living, protective factors. And the work that I and my colleagues do is rather than focusing on all the risks and the deficits and the disorders and the challenges, we have more than ample curiosity about what is working for that individual. What are the things that stop them from hurting themselves? What are the situations, the relationships that minimize risky behavior? All the reasons for living. And one of the things that we'll emphasize is that recovery from anything, physical illness, mental illness, suicidality, and self-injurious behavior, recovery is not the absence of symptoms. It's the installation of hope and meaning. So what we want to look for is how to restore a sense of value, purpose, and meaning in people's lives. Then we'll talk about, in a lot of detail, about what all of us can do. And then finally, we'll talk about coping with the suicide of someone you care for. And the reason that I want to talk about that is what I find in our community is we do a reasonable job in the first few days when we find out that somebody has committed suicide. But then all efforts sort of stop. And we tend to think very narrowly about who's affected. We think about parents and siblings and close friends, but we don't think about classmates and teachers and counselors and neighbors and people who may not even know that individual but are affected by that loss. So we're going to spend some time talking about that. So the key point are suicides are preventable. And here are the major ways in which they can be preventable. This slide comes from the World Health Organization. Restricting access to lethal means. And one of the things that we'll emphasize tonight is that most people are intensely wanting to die only for minutes or hours. Most people are not intensely, actively wanting to die for less than a day. So if they don't have 
loaded firearms available or ways of taking medication or pills or substances which are lethal in a relatively low dose, even though they're intensely suicidal, they won't have a way to kill themselves. So if we can minimize the access to lethal ways of self-harm, we can prevent death, okay, which is what we want to do. We want to identify people who have risk early, rather than after the fact, certainly, or late in the process. We want responsible media reporting. And what that means is that if we call undue attention to suicide, which is often called in the literature valorizing, which means that we pay special attention to someone who suicides, what happens for a lot of people is they say, here's this person who seems to have so much going for them. They're famous, they're attractive, and yet they felt that desperate that they wanted to die. What about me, who seems to have so much less? Okay? So it's really important that we are thoughtful about how we memorialize suicide and remember the survivors. We also have to be careful about what's called disenfranchised grief. There are a lot of religions, for instance, that won't bury a suicide or won't have funeral rites for a suicide. There are cultures and communities that won't acknowledge a suicide if somebody commits suicide as a way of dying. So we have to be careful about that. Training of healthcare workers, but that also means everybody in the community. And then, follow-up care and community support. So one thing that I find really enlightening and enheartening is that in a very um, significant poll that was conducted in September 2018 in this country, and it was conducted by a variety of alliances for suicide prevention, 94% 94% of respondents said that suicide can be prevented, which is astonishing, because a lot of us felt in the field that very few people had that belief. And the same group of people, 94%, said if they knew that somebody was thinking of committing suicide, they would want to do something about it. They would want to help. So one of my favorite people growing up and still, is Mr. Rogers. And Mr. Rogers always talked about there are helpers everywhere. And for suicide prevention, there are. So that's the whole purpose of tonight, is that you can all be helpers. You can all help people prevent suicide. So who dies by suicide in New Mexico? Whites and American Indians have the highest rate. Now, the suicide rate, now this is the people who kill themselves when they make an attempt. That's what suicide rate means, as opposed to suicide, quote, attempts, okay? Is 3.5 3 times higher for men than women. Now, the issue with that is that traditionally, it had been much higher than that. It had even been 10 times greater in the past. But the issue is, is that men often, when they make an attempt, they use much more violent means, guns or hanging. Okay? Women traditionally had used overdose, pills or cutting. And as we'll see, the chances of lethality for cutting are less than a percent. Okay? For overdose, it's in some studies as low as 7%, 5%. If you use a gun, a firearm that's loaded, it's 80 to 90% that you're going to die. So the unfortunate trend is women are becoming more violent in their attempts. So that's why the gender gap is narrowing. In New Mexico, and these are 2019 statistics, which means they're basically based on 2018 data, so they're the more recent data we have. On the average, one person dies by suicide every 18 hours in New Mexico. Every 18 hours, one person dies of suicide. And if you look at the bottom on the right-hand side, you'll see that New Mexico 
is number four in suicides per capita in the country. So there are many ways in which we're an outlier in an unfortunate kind of way. And I'm sure you're all aware, unfortunately, of suicide clusters, or it's also called suicide contagion, which means a number of suicides that occur within a short time span in the same neighborhood. It happens in schools, it happens in neighborhoods. It's very concerning, and that's why we're here. I wanted to talk about LGBTQ youth because they're especially at risk for a variety of reasons. And this is uh, the risk and resiliency survey that all the schools in our state um, give to all the students. So these are self-reports. These aren't somebody else's assessment. And if you look at it, 14% um, or so are more likely to live in unstable housing. 50% are more likely to binge drink than their non-LGBTQ classmates. Nine times more likely to have used heroin. Four times more likely to have used painkillers. But here's the important point to that. Related to this, they are twice as likely to be bullied at school. More than half of bisexual youth had non-suicidal self-injury. More than one in four had attempted suicide in the past year. One in four. And this is self-report, meaning that it's probably more than that, right? Now, one of the things that we know, though, that's really important, and I'll cut back to this, is that for all the populations at risk, if discrimination is minimized and bullying and social acceptance is heightened, the risk is identical to the people who are not in those communities. So it's really a cultural social response. It's not that if you're American Indian or if you're LGBTQ, you're inherently damaged or prone to risk. It's if you're in a safe environment that acknowledges who you are and accepts and approves and supports that difference that you have, your outcome is good. So this is another way in which we can all prevent suicidality. Here, what I wanted to show you, and this is a relatively new study, just published in May 2019, is that if only one parent had prescriptions of opioids, okay, prescriptions of opioids, that doubles the risk of suicide attempt in their children. So we're not talking about opioid overdose, just having opioid prescriptions. And again, that's because of unintentional attempts that lead to potential use of lethal means. So myths. One of the most common ones is, if someone is really suicidal, they're probably going to kill themselves no matter what you do. Here's what's really important. More than 90%, in some studies as high as 95%, of the most serious attempters never make another attempt. Okay? So the people who repeat life-threatening attempts are very small. Number two, asking a depressed person about suicide may put the idea in their heads. This is really damaging as a myth. And the reason for that is, if we're trying to identify people early, remembering that it's by self-report, again, it's not by somebody else's assessment. If we have this idea, parents, teachers, counselors, that if we ask about suicide, we're somehow indoctrinating people or hypnotizing people or suggesting to people that they commit suicide, then we can't screen, then we can't identify early. And 50 years, 50 years of research say that asking about suicide does not suggest suicide or make it more likely. In fact, it makes it more likely to get people the help that they need. 
So it's very important to know that. There's no point in asking about suicidal thoughts. If someone is going to do it, they won't tell you. That's true, but for a very small minority of people. Okay? And so if you look at what we know in the literature, at least 80% of people who die by suicide give some kind of indication or warning, and we'll go through what those warnings might be. Ambivalence and contradictory behavior are common. So what this means is, for most of us, whenever we have challenges, we have pros and cons. And some of it depends on who we're with and what the context is and how we're feeling at that particular moment. Sometimes we're more hopeful, sometimes we're less hopeful. So the issue is that the majority of people do give us warnings that we need to pay attention to. And here's the, the next thing that's also very toxic as a belief. Someone making suicidal threats won't really do it. They're just looking for attention. I can't tell you how many times I hear from parents and teachers and all that. They're only doing it for attention. Well, my standard answer to that is, we all want attention. That's what relationship means. Pay attention to me. Care for me. I'm paying attention to you. So attention-seeking is how we connect to each other. That's how we show, that's what a mother does for a child, is to attend to them, to attend to their needs. So what we're really looking at is, what are they trying to communicate? What are they trying to impart to us? And this last one is really important too. If you stop someone from killing themselves one way, they'll probably find another. Remember that we already talked about that, that in the vast majority of cases, right, people do not repeat a lethal attempt, the vast majority. So that's why it's so important to be hopeful about this. What is a suicide attempt? A self-injurious act committed with at least some intent to die as a result of the act. And one of the things that we like to ask as a question, especially of children, is did any part of you think about doing this? Because a lot of us have, you know, sort of like those old cartoons where there's the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other, and they're both talking to you at the same time. So sometimes you'll feel like hopeless, and sometimes you won't. So sometimes you'll say, did any part of you want to kill yourself? And for smaller children, another way of saying that is, instead of killing, because that's confusing, right? For a four or five or a six-year-old, but if you say, did you ever feel like you just didn't want to wake up? tomorrow morning, that life is so hard that you just don't want to wake up and face the day, and then you'll get some sense of where they are on that continuum. Here are six standard questions. It's part of what we use in our assessment. It's called the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. And um, my group, with the support of the Department of Health, is training everybody in New Mexico to be able to use this template. So we start with, have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? I was talking Have you actually had thoughts about killing yourself or wanting to die? Have you been thinking about how you might do this? Do you have some vague idea of how you might do this? Pills, hanging, jumping, whatever. And then the fourth piece is, when you have those kinds of thoughts, does some part of you think that you might actually want to do it? It's one thing to have thoughts. It's another thing to have an intention behind it. Have you started to work out or worked out the details? So you're beginning to think not just these vague ideas, but like, what pills would I use? Where could I get them? Where could I find them? How could I store them so nobody would find out where they are? And then the last one, have you ever done anything, started to do anything, or prepared to do anything to end your life? So what we're talking about is vague kinds of thoughts and wishes, more concrete thoughts, a vague idea of a method, a plan, 
and then actually thinking of the plan in some detail, if not sort of rehearsing it. How might it work out? And that tells us where somebody is as far as their desire, their intent, and their planning. So warning signs, a lot of you know all of this. Wanting to die, never waking up, feeling hopeless, having no purpose, no reason to live, which is why in our project, we always are looking for reasons to live, wherever they lie. Being a burden to others, feeling trapped, being an unbearable pain. Risky behaviors are probably very common sense to all of you. Increasing the use of alcohol or drugs, looking for a way to end their lives, withdrawing from activities, sleeping too much, fatigue, giving away possessions. That happens relatively late and more often for older people than younger people. Here's what I wanted to emphasize. When we actually look at people who've made life-threatening attempts and say, what stressed you that you were driven to do this, this is what they identify. They identify hurt, anguish, or misery in their mind, psychological pain, feeling really pressured and overwhelmed, by what's been happening lately. The sense of, I don't mean necessarily physical agitation here, but the sense of, I've got to do something to stop this or to change this. I have to act. Hopelessness is, no matter what I do, it's never going to change. It's no, never going to get better. And self-hate, lack of self-respect, disliking yourself, knowing you're doing things that damage yourself, but not being able to stop. And the risk factors vary by age group, culture, sex, and other characteristics. I wanted to reemphasize what I said earlier. Stress resulting from prejudice and discrimination. Family rejection, bullying, violence is a known risk factor for a lot of communities. Historical trauma for American Indians and Alaskan Natives. For men in the middle years, role transitions, such as retirement, unemployment, divorce, all of those things are important risk factors. Now, what are reasons for living? Hope. Attachment to life, to belonging, to family, to friends. Some kind of sense that you have coping skills. And again, one of the differences of our program is instead of looking at all the things that you don't have, we look at all the things that you already have that you can build upon. Fear of suicide is really helpful in preventing it. A lot of people think it's immoral. A lot of people worry that if they take pills, they won't die, but they'll end up a paraplegic or brain damage. That stops them from killing themselves. Good thing. Motivated to overreport risk, this is another thing. We'd much rather have people who constantly say, I'm really feeling like I want to die, than people who hold that within because they don't want to, you know, burden other people or worry other people. And one thing that I wanted to encourage you to do is to totally eliminate the phrase suicide gesture. They're not gesturing, they're communicating their distress. We need to honor and respect that. So responsibility to others. There's a lot of people who would say, I really wanted to die, but I wouldn't do that to my mother or my father or my brother or my sister or to my dog or to my cat. You know, they belong to someone else and they don't want to leave them. Social support, connectiveness, positive contact, attachment. And then there are evidence-based therapies that are suicidality specific. And again, in our program, we talk about a variety of them including the collaborative assessment and management of suicidality, which is a peer-based approach. Um, and one of the things that we'll talk about very quickly tonight is about safety plan. All of us, all of us can help co-create a safety plan for youth at risk. All of us can contribute to the effort to minimize access to lethal means. So what is safety planning? It's an agreement and a commitment to use skills that you have and the skills that you develop 
to support getting through times of high emotion and distress before you try to hurt yourself. So here's the outline of a safety plan. And I'm going to highlight these different points. But the key things is for the warning signs to be recognized by that person. So I'm not sleeping well now, or I'm using more drugs, or I'm getting more drunk at parties, some kind of risky behavior that's unusual for me, that's a warning sign to me, right? This is all for that person. We start in a very deliberate way with safety planning with the things that they can do on their own, the things they can do for themselves. Because another thing we want to do is, for people who are feeling hopeless and helpless and worthless, we want to say, look at all that you can do for yourself. Look at all the skills and the capacities that you already have. Let's build on that, as opposed to you are worthless and hopeless and helpless. You need experts to help you. You need all these people to give you the things that you lack. We want to be on an inventory of looking at all the resources they already possess and building on that. So that's what on my, open, on my own coping is. With a friend coping, the next step is just connecting to friends for fun things. It's not connecting to friends for advice or for counsel or for support, right? It's saying, let's go to a movie. Let's go out to a park. Let's go dancing together. Let's get me out of this space of thinking over and over again about poor pitiful me and how life is so difficult. How can I get out of that space with your help? Telling someone is when you're helping them to resolve a crisis. So you can see we start with the things that they can do on their own, the things they can call on their natural supports, and then finally turning to others. And rather than turning to professionals first, we want them to turn to their natural supports, their peers, their friends, their classmates, their teachers, their counselors, at school. And then finally, we end up in looking at what are professional resources. So one of the things, too, that we want to do is whenever we're dealing with somebody who's at suicidal risk, we don't want to give them just the number of an 800 crisis line, right? We want to say, here's all the things that you can do for yourself. Here's all the things that your friends have to offer you. And then we want to talk about reducing access of lethal means. Now, why do we do that towards the end of the safety planning? Think about it this way. If you're absolutely desperate, and you've been thinking very seriously about wanting to die, and you're thinking especially about using a firearm, the last thing you want to do is when somebody first meets you, they say, I want to take away the way that you're going to end your life and end your pain, right? So we want to start with, what are all the things that you're hopeful about? What are all the reasons on the other side that tell you you still want to live, you still want to connect, you still want to support. What are the ways that you found out how to help yourself with that? So as an example, it's a way of looking at things very differently. If someone comes in and talks about a very stressful event and how they felt suicidal, instead of focusing on that, which we often do, right? Tell me about that awful event and how you felt, and what you thought. We also want to say, so what was different about all those other days when you felt less suicidal, less wanting to die? What was different about that? Oh, I was with my friend, and when I'm with my friend, they're very happy, and they're very supportive, and I feel very lo loved and taken care of. Oh, so when you look at that week, one day out of the week, you felt absolutely terrible, but six days out of the week, you felt okay. And two days out of the week, you felt pretty great. Well, that's wonderful. How can we recreate all those times for you? Okay? That's a strength-based approach as opposed to a deficit approach. And then we'll talk about how to reduce access. And then we always ask, now that we've gone through this, how do you now feel about how likely you are to hurt yourself? And what we typically find is if we do this safety planning, the risk is lower because now they have tools. They have resources that they can call on. They know what to do.
So the warning signs we've gone through a little bit. I'm going to go through them pretty quick. On my own, I wanted to emphasize this. There's three broad categories for that. One is distraction. Distraction is a good thing, you know. Um, so those are activities, music, helping out, humor, counting, reading, repeating songs or poems, games, anything that takes you out of that negative space. I often like to give a very simple example of that um, for um, some depressed people that I've met with who have pets. They typically walk their pets in a particular place. So I say, do you run into certain people around the same time? And they say, yes. So how about you make a date that you'll walk your dogs at the same time, and maybe your friend will give you a call. That way you're increasing socialization, removing isolation, they're in contact with their pet. And as we all know, you walk your dog, you meet a lot of people. Right? So it accomplishes a lot, and it seems to be very trivial, but that's a really important way of helping someone get out of the house, connect, and think in the back of their mind, well, I don't want to kill myself. Who's going to take care of my cat or my pet that I, you know, I really care for? Soothing is you know, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, aromatherapy, um, anything that will make you absorbed in those pleasurable sensations and pleasurable activities and out of that negative space. For some people, it's muscle relaxation, it's deep breathing exercises, anything that can calm you. Exercise is really helpful for depression. There's some terrific evidence that if you have mild levels of depression, aerobic exercise brings you back to stability. With a friend is things like socialization, going to a library, not a bar, going to a talk like this, um, listing more than one person as the first person might not be available to help. And one of the things that we can do too is tell people how to ask for help. Because if you, it's one thing to say, I'm feeling absolutely desperate, I'm going to kill myself, can you come over right now? It's another thing to say, you know, I'm feeling a little bit blue, I could use some company, you want to come over and play some video games. Very different. Telling someone is saying, I'm having a struggle dealing with this particular situation. What advice can you offer me? And then, like I said, professional kind of help is the New Mexico Crisis and Access Line throughout our state, Agora, which is uh, located at UNM, the Suicide Prevention, which is national. Now I want to talk about reducing access to lethal means. So I already mentioned this, but I want to reinforce it. People are more likely to talk about this if they have ideas about alternatives to suicide. So that's why we go through that whole scheme of the safety planning first. Okay? And then you ask what they thought about, what they might use. And even if they don't mention firearms, always ask if they have access. And the reason for this being so successful is the following. Like I mentioned earlier, acute suicidal crisis is often very brief. It's rare. It does happen, especially for adults who have what's called treatment-resistant major depressive disorder with a high level of severity. Those are folks who have tried a lot of things to help them and feel very desperate because nothing has. But that is not true of the vast majority of people. So most people are ambivalent about ending their life. If a highly lethal means aren't available, people will either delay the attempt or use a less lethal means so they won't die. So we're not trying to minimize suicidal intent. We're trying to minimize death. Okay? This increases the chance that the person will get effective help. Here's the research that supports that. Study of youth 13 to 34, attempted suicide showed that for 25%, the time between the decision and the action was less than five minutes. Okay, less than five minutes. And in fact, most, most youth 
commit suicide or try to attempt suicide impulsively. And it's usually because of an interpersonal issue. It's usually what we call atypical features of depression, which means that you're very sensitive to being discounted, abandoned, rejected. And in that moment, you feel desperate. But again, if you don't have lethal pills handy, you can't go off in a corner and hang yourself because you're with a lot of other people. No access to firearms. You might feel that, but you have no way of dying from that feeling, from that thought. So that's why reducing access is so critical. One third of you suicides were within 24 hours of an interpersonal crisis, and that's underreported. In my personal experience, and that of my colleagues, we would say, like, when we look at admissions to our psychiatric unit, talking to the faculty and to the fellows, some of whom are here, it's much higher than that. A CDC study showed that 24% of suicide attempts were less than five minutes after the decision, and only 14% were more than tw uh, 24 hours. Only 14%. So we really can help a lot of people. Again, I referred to this earlier, but look at that. Gun attempts are as high as 95% lethal. Use a gun, you're going to die in most cases. Cutting, 1%. Overdose, 2%. 2%. Okay? Very low. Suffocation, and that's mainly by hanging, 69%. Um, Here's a very important study. So the Golden Gate Bridge is one of those places, um, like unfortunately in Taos, we have a similar situation of people who jump from a high level. 95% of those who were stopped from jumping never went on to die by suicide, 95%. <coughs> and most importantly, the 5% who survived, was only 5% survived the jump. Of the 5% who survived, only one out of hundreds said, I wish I had succeeded. I wish I had died. All the rest of them, the thousands of the rest of them said, thank God I didn't die. Thank God it didn't happen. And, <coughs> excuse me, of those people who survived the jump, they said that, in the seconds when they had left, that's when they said, why did I do that? Okay? So you can see that reducing access to lethal means can really be life-saving. If you make, a, again, a highly lethal means less accessible, you reduce suicide attempts, delay suicide attempts, or suicide attempts are made with less lethal means. So if we're really talking about preventing death, this is the way to do it, and we can all do that. We can all look at firearm safety for all the adults. We can look at, do we need to have all the drugs that we have? We should throw out all the drugs that are past due date. We should throw out any drugs that are dangerous that we don't need. We should make sure that the drugs that we do need are not accessible to the teenagers much less the little kids. And one study um, that I don't have on a slide is just the addition, remember the Tylenol overdose issue, right, and the contamination with Tylenol and the danger of Tylenol? So how did they address that? Blister packs and tamper-proof bottles. So what are blister packs? That means that you have to pop every pill. So it means that to take a bunch of pills, it takes a lot of time, which means that you're sitting there going like, do I really want to do all that? As opposed to dumping open the bottle, right? Those simple measures can save lives. Okay? So the key steps are asking if there's a plan, saying you want to help. And remember that poll, 94% of people said that they want to help. Okay? So all of us can help. Ask about access to lethal means, 
discuss steps they can take to remove or at least reduce access to firearms, other lethal means. The most important thing I need to remember about why I should live, this is from Martin Luther King. Yesterday was Martin Luther King Day. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. So what I wanted to tell you is that there are apps. One of our jokes in our group is we always say we have an app for that. But everybody likes smartphones. Um, and one that we really like um, is My3. These are all government sponsored. Uh, none of us get any money for this. They're free. Um, but what they have is you can put the faces of three people who are your natural supports. You press their image. You get their contact information. You call them. You email them. And all those steps that I outlined, they're right there. Warning signs, coping strategies, internal is the on my own, social supports with a friend, family and friends for crisis help, asking people for support, professionals and agencies. <clears throat> all on that. There's also the virtual hope box. Those are for people who like to have um, motivational kinds of quotes, pictures that make them feel good. It's a way of having, you know, sort of like, in our old-fashioned times, it was actually a hope box, right? This is a virtual hope box. Um, and again, what I want to emphasize is developing a meaningful life worth living is more than just relapse prevention. It's more than just the absence of symptoms. And what we've outlined is coping and problem-solving skills, enhancing reasons for living, while minimizing, eliminating reasons for dying, looking at short and long-term plans, hope for the future, looking at beliefs. And one of the things that we want to focus on, instead of, again, just signs and symptoms and syndromes, is what are the values that that person has? What it makes their life meaningful to them? Is it contributing to other people? Is it being generous? Is it being kind? Is it being connected? Is it being a teacher or an instructor or a helper or a guide? What gives their life meaning? Now we're going to talk about those who are left behind. Coping with the suicide of someone you care for. And this poster is really graphic. Every 40 seconds, someone in the world dies by suicide. Every 41 seconds, someone is left to make sense of it. Okay, so a lot of the people who are bereaved by suicide are often affected in these various ways. I should have seen it coming. I should have done something to stop it. How could they leave me in this way? Didn't I mean something to them? If only I'd said or done things differently, they'd still be alive. It's all my fault. How could I have been so clueless? Why didn't they trust me? Why didn't they let me know what was going on with them? Everyone blames and judges me for their death as if I'm the problem. And that happens with parents, with teachers, with therapists. Why didn't you know? How come you couldn't stop it? Why am I so guilty feeling relieved that their suffering is over? And you hear this a lot from people who have chronic problems with substance abuse, chronic mental problems, where it's like, I know I shouldn't be feeling this, but their suffering is an end, and so is mine, and I feel terrible about it. So briefly, the types of grief that we want to look at is especially the last two when we're talking about surviving a suicide. Disenfranchised grief is grief that's not acknowledged by society. So that could be you're in an LGBTQ relationship, and you can't, because of your culture and your community, you can't let people know who's important to you. You have a relationship that's trivialized, so it's a pet. It's only a pet. It's only your next door neighbor. It's only your teacher. It's only your student. Why are you so upset, right? And then for women, the incredible loss because of miscarriage and abortion is very rarely acknowledged by society and people want to look the other way. So that's also minimized. Complicated grief 
is when it lasts way too long. And one of the most common ways in which complicated grief comes up is by suicide, losing someone to suicide. Ambiguous loss is where the body is still there, but the person is gone. Okay? So what that means is you lose someone you care about to substance abuse. You lose them to dementia. You lose them to severe physical illness. Okay? But the person that you knew is gone from your life, and you don't know how to deal with that. And sometimes, in the case of people with risky behavior, they're literally gone. We don't know where they, they left. They were homeless, they disappeared, and so we don't know how to mourn because we don't know what to do. And again, because of the cultural stigma of suicide, oftentimes there's no cultural or community or religious acknowledgement of the suicide. You are shunned if you're a family member of a suicide. So grief is always embedded in a context. And the reason that I wanted to end with this is because this particular form of grief, complicated grief, which is much more common, unusually severe and prolonged, after the loss of a child or a life partner, and I put in bold, after a sudden death by violent means, what could be more sudden and violent than suicide or homicide? After discovering the body of the deceased, huge issue for traumatic re-experiencing of that loss. Those issues are very common in suicide survivors. And so knowing that you're suffering from this, it's important to know that there is an evidence-based practice called complicated grief treatment. And this is a training that I and my colleagues are providing throughout the state. It's a specialized form of grief therapy that is not traditional grief therapy. It is not treatment for depression. It is not treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. It's unique to complicated grief, and it has a very high effectiveness rate. So this is just to make you all aware, just like there are suicidality-specific treatments, there's also a suicide survivor specific treatment if you do suffer from complicated grief. So I wanted to leave you with that. And I like this poem an awful lot from Emily Dickinson. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. That's what I wanted to leave you with is the installation of hope. Here's the contact information for the New Mexico Crisis Access Line. And again, there's lots of material out in the front. Please feel free to grab that. And then here's the contact information for me at UNM and my wonderful colleague, who's snowbound in Colorado, uh, Laura Rombach, who's the program manager, and she's also a counselor. Feel free to email both of us. Um, and especially if you know that your community is in need of training, we'd be more than happy under the auspices of the Department of Health to offer that training.